So, without further ado, welcome, Jane. Okay, sort microphone out. I like to wander around, so I'm going to try this. Hold until green, Joseph. Uh, oh, it's green. Has that worked? Yes. Can you hear me at the back? Brilliant, thanks. If I start making your ears bleed because it goes horribly wrong, just wave at me, won't you? Thank you so much for inviting me here today um, to come and talk about this project that we've done at Nottingham Trent. Um, it's a project called Scale Up. I'll explain a bit more about Scale Up uh, in a moment or two. It's not a new pedagogy, but I think the way that we try to do the project at Nottingham Trent is possibly quite new because um, instead of trying it in one subject area um, and then seeing if it worked in others, we, we, went, we went large. We did it across the institution and did it in many, many disciplines and across institutional project, which has its um, challenges but also great benefits. So... Um, as Graham said, I'm going to tell you the story, and then Dave Fairhurst is going to do scale up. No pressure there, Dave, uh, later on. So the story I'm going to tell, roughly, is why, why we did this, uh, how we did it, and uh, what happened. <laughs> so that's the story. So before I start, then, before I get started with uh, how we did it, is, um, how many people in the room have heard of scale up, or teal sometimes it's called? Have you heard of scale up or teal? A few, actually quite a few, brilliant, thank you. I will explain it briefly then for those who haven't um, and then you can experience it live if you like. So we first came across it in the States um, when I went on a study trip to the States. Thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor. Um, and of course you might have heard of Teal at MIT and obviously they've got loads of money in America, haven't they? And they had lots of wonderful uh, teaching spaces and we were looking at space and technology and different pedagogies. But then we went to um, uh, North Carolina State University where we met this charming gentleman, Professor Robert Beekner, who's told us a very compelling story about this scale-up methodology that he'd developed for first-year physics. And he's very, very um, convincing when he talks about it. And if you want to see a bit more about it afterwards, that's a, a, a still from a video that he's put on YouTube, and it's a very um, compelling case that he makes. So scale-up, and that's the space that scale-up takes place in with a, a, a charming brown carpet there. It's obviously maybe designed in the 70s, I don't know. Sorry, I've just offended everyone who's got a brown carpet now, haven't I? Um, uh, and a space built for collaborative learning, as you can see, quite, as quite an unlike space as, as a traditional lecture theatre, as you could imagine. So um, scale-up uh, stands for student-centered active learning environment with upside-down pedagogies, catchy. Um, it's, flip, it's a flipped model of learning. It's very active, very collaborative. It's problem-based learning, uh, technology-rich, um, and it's characterized by this space. It's not only about the room, because it, there's an actual methodology that you follow, but it's characterized by these spaces with these lovely round tables and open spaces with lots of circulation space. And the, as you'll see, the, uh, the kind of lecture podium is right in the middle, so it's, not a, a, it's a student-centered mode. So um, that's very quickly what it is. Why we did it, well, um, it was very appealing to us at the time that we heard about it for three reasons. The first reason is about inquiry-based learning. Now, I'm sure that uh, many of you do inquiry-based learning and are interested in inquiry-based learning. It's a very attractive mode of teaching. It's associated with higher um, uh, learning outcomes and good employability, but it's quite expensive to do it well with a large cohort. Is that your experience? Do you find, no, someone's going, no, it's very cheap. <laughs> um, can be quite expensive because you, you, you quite need quite a small groups, lots of tutor time. Um, so scale up is a, uh, a method where um, you can do problem-based learning with one lecturer to 100 students in the room, one to 100 ratio, which is pretty good for anyone who's paying the bills and doing the workload planning for their team. Uh, also, another thing about EBL, inquiry-based learning, is you need to build the students up to it, don't you? You can't just throw them into inquiry-based learning. And uh, scale-up works quite well. And the reason it works quite well is if you're thinking about 
This is um, Philippa Levy's uh, typology of inquiry-based learning. Obviously, there are many. If you're thinking about scale-up, it sits in the kind of bottom two areas on this uh, quadrant. So it's, it's, it's staff-led, usually around clo quite closed questions, problem-based learning, but it's a nice lead-in to more open inquiry later on and helps students... Uh, get their heads around that way of working, which can be quite challenging for the student who wants to sit in a, a room like this and be talked at, which some of our students do. So that's one reason. Second reason was the benefits that had been demonstrated for scale-up in the United States, and this very widely used in the US, now sort of spreading out across the, um, the world, but I mean over 200 institutions have been using it, and the benefits that have been demonstrated were very appealing for us uh, at Trent. So Bob Beekner's work uh, over many years with physics students had found that using this technique, he, uh, the student's ability to solve problems improved. He demonstrated this. Uh, their conceptual understanding increased. This was first year physics he's teaching. Their uh, expectations about the course or what we call, he calls attitudes, we would call maybe um, engagement or, uh, and certainly satisfaction, and their attendance improved, and the failure rates were significantly reduced, particularly for students with some widening participation characteristics. So um, Nottingham Trent, I'm sure like Sheffield Hallam, widening participation university with good track record in engaging non-traditional students and we want them to do well. <coughs> Very interesting for us. It also found that at-risk students did better at later modules. He's characterizing at-risk students as the students who might be just doubting um, whether they should be at university or in danger of um, academic failure. So really, really compelling benefits that he had demonstrated and have been demonstrated at other institutions. <laughs> and the third reason that we were interested in it was because of the dominance of the lecture in our pedagogic landscape, if you like. This is going in and out, isn't it? Can you still, is it all right? Yeah, okay, so it's just me, it's my ears. Thank you. Hi there, at the back. Um, and I think, Graham, you once said to me, um, that sometimes our signature pedagogy is a lecture, not because we want it, but because of the, the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And I think that's probably echoed by just about every course leader on the planet, I imagine. So we wanted to challenge the dominance of the lecture, and we thought that this was a, a good scale-up is a way that you can teach a large cohort not in a lecture, in a much more active and engaged way. Of course, the lecture has a place, obviously it does, but we want to dom challenge the dominance of it. So what we're talking about, really, was an institutional change project. Our lawyers, who, who jumped into Scale Up, the law school, really like Scale Up, and they have used it to, they wanted to move away from the lecture seminar model um, in three to five years. So lots of um, law lecturers came into the Scale Up project, uh, and this is what they wanted to do, use it consciously in that way. So those were my reasons for finding um, scale-up compelling and the reasons that I sold to our senior management team so that they would give us some money. Um, but we also asked the lecturers what their reasons were, because this was a voluntary project. No one had to do it. And we came back and we said, do you like this? And lots and lots of people said, yes, let's give it a go. And all our learning and teaching coordinators were really enthusiastic. So we wanted to know why lecturers were interested in doing it. So we asked them, surprisingly enough. And broadly, you can characterize their reasons like this. So again, the lectures were perceived to be an effective um, interest in technology. The rooms themselves are nice, appealing spaces, aren't they? Um, opportunity to develop uh, problem-based learning, engagement with students, trying a new teaching approach, opportunity to teach the whole cohort in one room. So some of the quotations reflect these, involving students, interactive teaching, technology and education. I'm always happy to have a go with new approaches that can improve our teaching. So very much that the colleagues that we were attracting to scale up are very much the colleagues who are happy to innovate and ha have a go at something and, and happy with ambiguity, which is probably a good idea because it was a big project and we did it quite quickly. So it was a lot of hard work. So, is that enough on the general background and, and the motivations? Yes, people are saying, move along, tell us what happened. I'll tell you uh, how we did it then. 
So it's an institutional project, quite complicated to get from zero to teaching um, in a year, which is what we did. So um, this is roughly the timeline from zero to, the, to when teaching started in September the 23rd. We met Bob in September 2012, we decided to do it, convinced the university that we should, recruited to it, had a teleconference with Bob, a scale-up day, because you have to learn this um, methodology. Bob says that um, if you just put a lecturer in a scale-up room, it's not that you just naturally adapt to it, some will. At MIT, they had a terrible problem at first when they adopted scale-up, they call it teal, because they didn't do this preparation. They just went, there are the rooms, go, teach. And so a lot of people just stood there and tried to lecture and went, well, it's rubbish, this, because I'm standing in the middle of the room. How do I give a lecture like this? And this is uh, a very real challenge. So we had to do loads of stuff and figuring it out. And I'm sure Dave will tell you there was lots of people going, well, how am I going to do this? And how am I going to do that? Um, lots of peer support. Uh, we had to adapt some spaces, of course, which I, I promise I will get around to talking about space sooner or later. Um, uh, to, to do it in, and actually, I don't know how, how you are here, we have a real lack of large, flat spaces that can accommodate a cohort that you can do something more flexible in. So they're all predicated on little teaching rooms, yes. So we had to spend some money there, a bit of money, and then we started teaching in uh, 20, uh, September 2013, and that's when the evaluation began in earnest. So we're now in our second year. Obviously, it was much more complicated than that, and there was lots of going to... I the number of committees I discovered that I didn't even know existed that I had to convince. Timetabling committees and this group, operational group, and convince them to let us do it. Um, but we did. Uh, we did it on a loose project basis. So we wanted people to use scale up, but, but adapt it to their own context. We didn't want to be too rigid about it. So we had some researchers and some technical advice, and then we had loads of people helping it happen, giving us money, giving us approval, recruiting, giving us space. The library, bless them, gave us the super space, etc., etc., etc. But it's the group in the middle who did all the hard work, 37 pilot leaders and the module teams and their students who were just such good sports in developing this and giving it a go. And it's quite risky, isn't it, to try a whole new pedagogy in a new space with new technology. Um, that's, you, you're really putting yourself out there. Um, another thing that we did, rather than just do it in one subject or one level, we decided to do... Um, 13 subjects, 7 schools, right across levels 4 to 7. And people have said we were, uh, frankly, crazy to do that. But we wanted to create as much impact as possible in the first year. So you know all those great little projects that happen in one subject, and they never, they never expand beyond the subject. So we, know we, we knew we had to make a big splash um, in order, A, to attract the funding, and B, to um, have a, this kind of ripple effect, because we really wanted to challenge the university to think about um, the ways in which we could do uh, more active learning on a wider basis. So that's why we did it. Um, slightly scary, but there we are. So um, this is what the rooms looked like before we got our hands on them. Isn't that a lovely, lovely room? Who wouldn't want to teach in that space? <laughs> Can you imagine how, how many people have taught in spaces like that? I know I have. It's just depressing, isn't it? We taught in spaces like that and had to try and balance a projector on top of a computer and get students clustered around. Just, just awful. So um, we got a couple of spaces like that. One, a small one at Clifton, about 52 to 54 uh, seat, and then a bigger one about um, getting on over just about 100 in the city side. The first thing we came across is, is um, the utilization people said, no, you will reduce the capacity of the room by putting what, round tables in it. We cannot do this. It didn't. That was a 54-seater before, and with scale-up it was a 52-seater, so it didn't appreciably impact. This is a myth. Don't, don't let people tell you this. So that's before. <laughs> and that's after. And that's a much nicer space. You can't see the tech because it's uh, locked away in cupboards, hopefully, there. But um, they have, we have laptops, nine students to a table, working in three groups with different roles in that group. Each group has a, a laptop. There are a couple of iPads in the room. There are little whiteboards for the students to write on. There are displays around the room. Um, much nicer space. But it's not science fictional, is it? It's not something that's beyond the reach of a university to build a room like that. It's not 
so tech heavy that you've got holograms, I don't know, whatever it is in the middle. It's just an ordinary teaching space. But those round tables are really, really good. We had to get them built um, specially because Bob is really insistent. He's tried this over years and he's found the optimal size and shape of table for collaborative group work. And you, you laugh, but it, it's, he's very particular about this and then the distance between them. So that's the space. And there was lots of trial and error getting there, testing equipment, testing Apple TV. Oh, why did we use Apple TV? Because it wasn't very good. But, <laughs> but the, IS, the IS people said, yay, have this, it's new. And we were like, OK. Um, that's people, there's a picture of today. That's you in that photo, <laughs> standing next to a librarian and a technologist scratching his head, trying to figure out the equipment. Um, orientations in the room so that because you, you don't want to go in the room with new technology teaching, do you? You want to get your hands on it before you get in there. Um, well, more orientation sessions, learning how to do scale up, and then finally uh, doing it. So that's how we got there. We did loads of publicity. Um, I, I say this just because in order to get an institution to go with you and do a thing, you just have to be relentless, don't you, on the publicity? Because you get to that point in the project that you get to in any project where everyone's getting a bit grumpy and it's like, oh, yeah, have you heard that's going really badly, that project? So we just had to keep a relentless optimism. And it was like, do not speak ill of scale up um, <laughs> so that we could actually carry on doing it and keep getting support. So we did uh, a relentless amount of publicity for every stakeholder we could think of. OK, so I'll go on to what happened next, Shai, and then what we learned, because you might be interested. Well, hurrah. That was our first class. That was education in the city in September 2013. Thanks to that student who's yawning. <laughs> Students gave, gave permission for us to use their photos. Shall I come over here for a bit? Can you still hear me? Hello, Maybe this side of the room. Yeah, she, she's not really yawning. She's going, actually. <laughs> yeah, bless her. Thanks for that. So when we started teaching, we put loads of support in the rooms. So people there for tech support in case the equipment went wrong. Um, people there to troubleshoot. Uh, we started doing observations and evaluation in earnest. Um, and actually, a lot of the colleagues who have taught Scale Up last year have said, it's so nice to be in a space and be supported and know the tech support's there and they've got you back. And know that if you report a problem, it'll get fixed like that, not in three weeks' time. So it's a real lesson for us about how teaching should be all of the time. Um, if we can persuade the university to fund that level of support for every teaching room, that would be super. Um, so our first class. And... Um, and it went, went through the year. We did lots of evaluation. Let me talk a bit about evaluation, actually. Because there were three things we wanted to show. We wanted to, of course, assess those scale-up intended benefits at NTU. You know, those benefits that I talked about that have been shown in the US. We wanted to see if they would work for us and across lots of disciplines. Because scale-up started in physics but it has been used in many different subjects, but we were using it in loads. And some people will tell you that inquiry-based learning, oh, it only works in law and medicine, they'll say, but you know, but we wanted to test whether that, was, whether that was true. We also needed to identify conditions needed for scale-up. So things like just the, the basic stuff like, oh, my team leader says I can't have the workload allowance that I need, or oh, it's impacted on my contact hours, or timetabling say I can't get into the room, you know, all of that practical stuff. Um, so we could advise the university, and I'll share a bit of that in a minute or two, if you like. And then we wanted to assess the potential and feasibility for wider use. So could scale-up become a major feature of our teaching landscape, or was it always going to be niche? This is what we wanted to understand. So that's what we were evaluating. Um, and the challenges, of course, we had multiple disciplines, multiple levels of study. Uh, we had to give institutional information needs, so although a lot of the... Um, my colleagues and a lot of the people involved in the project valued the qualitative data that we were going to generate. The senior management team need numbers and they need us to show impact in quantitative terms. So we had to make sure we could get that um, data. 
we had constraints on data generation. So in the States, they have, um, for physics, for example, there's conceptual tests that you can benchmark against. We don't have that to the same extent in the UK, and we don't have it for all of our subjects. You can't test your students' understanding against a national um, benchmark. Uh, and then we were using mixed approaches to scale up, so we didn't want to constrain colleagues. So we said, look, you can use scale up in all your classes or just some of them. You can, you can use the core features or you can take the whole model. And we wanted people to be able to do that. So they had to self-identify so that we knew where they were in, on the landscape. The biggest challenge in evaluation, and we had a big town meeting to, to, to agree how we were going to evaluate it and, and everything, was the different ways of knowing in all of the subjects. So can you imagine if you've got people from English and people from history and people from physics and people from social sciences all discussing about um, well, what data is going to be valuable here and what methodologies. We had a massive argument about whether it was appropriate to, do, to use experimental technique or not in the social sciences. Well, no, you can't do that. And, the, and some of the, uh, the physical scientists, not physics, obviously, were going, yes, of course, you can experiment on the students. That's fine. So um, <laughs> that was quite good fun. But in the end, we ended up doing, I think, well, I've got here 49 interviews with tutors. Surveying 223 students, we did module satisfaction data, we had focus groups with 40 students, we did assessment grades, comparing them, we did attendance data, we did class observation, so it's a big evaluation, so we had a little research team supporting it. And we got lots of useful findings, I can't share them all now, but I will talk about a few of them that I thought you might be interested in. And we have written a report that, you know, you're welcome to read if, uh, if you've got a spare, you know, minute. So I thought you might be interested first in lectures experiences. Is that a good, good one? Um, because actually the, 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 we really wanted to make sure that everyone who was good enough to volunteer for this had a good experience. But here are some quotations. On the whole, a good experience, I think. Would you say that, Dave? Did you have a good experience? Hard work, scary at times but overall good. That's what I'm sensing. Dave's nodding. Thank you very much. <laughs> it would be funny if you went, no, it was awful, Jane. <laughs> so this is what some of what people said. I'll back around here so I can read it with you. So it's made me aware of how important it is to get the tasks right. I think some of the stuff I did in, the, in Scale Up wasn't the best. In a way, Scale Up has helped me to become more reflective in my practice. Not results, very nice. That was the hardest thing, wasn't it? Would you agree, Dave, designing the tasks for use in class to get the students engaged at the right level is the hardest thing. Second one, being able to interact with students is better than just standing in front of them talking. And it really did reinforce that, particularly going back into the lecture theatre. Um, I've been trying to keep uh, some of the principles. So some colleagues started using scale-up principles in their other classes and into the lectures. Results, brilliant. That interaction with students, I think a lot of colleagues said, look, it was hard work, but it's worth it for the greater interaction that you get with the students because that is much more rewarding to me as a teacher. And then finally, I have turned the curriculum upside down. Yay, flipped learning. Thank you very much. That's nice. So. So how about the students' experiences? We've got lots of data from students, but the first thing everybody wants to know is, oh, what if they hate it? Will they hate it? Well, thank heavens, the answer was no, they didn't hate it. This is the EVASYS. Um, do, you, do you use EVASYS module evaluation? It's like a, a survey instrument that we've introduced. Um, so module satisfaction data. And those are, it's out of five, I should say, those are good scores for a module. So that's the module satisfaction data for some of the modules we were using um, scale up on. So that's good. However, we must be open to the possibility that the lecturers who self-selected for scale up are the awesome lecturers anyway, and might, you know, might get very high scores anyway. And we didn't have a lot of comparative data. <laughs> through years across modules we did. So that's the first thing. Students were okay. They were positive. They weren't 100% um, positive. They didn't all love scale-up. So let's see some of the things that they said. I enjoy that we have more interaction with the tutor and as a class. That's one student quotation. Here's another one. Oh, time wasted on group discussions. <laughs> this is familiar, isn't it? <laughs> 
I feel more enthusiastic coming to these sessions, that's nice. Um, at first I didn't like it, but as time went on I enjoyed it, and it always kept people engaged, so that's good. Um, I like that I'm not just spoken to for an hour and that's it. I would have preferred to have a more traditional lecture. <laughs> Scale up's good, bigger groups, so more ideas on work. So it was mixed. Overall, when we look at the quantitative data, you always get a, a, a spread, don't you? But overall, it is positive. Um, but there are students who didn't like it. And we were, in talking about this, a lot of colleagues commented that they think it's quite exposing. If you're a student and you haven't done your preparation and you don't want to engage and you're not willing to um, work with your colleagues, it's, it's quite exposing. And that might be why they don't like it. But they are the minority. So we wanted to evaluate. Remember those benefits I talked about that were shown in the US, yeah? So those, they were, that's them kind of cut down. We wanted to evaluate whether they would work for us. So in our pilots, problem solving definitely improved in the uh, example in the US. For us, we had positive sides. We're, being, we're tentatively positive. And that's because a lot of the modules were involved didn't have problem solving explicitly as a learning outcome in their modules. So it's not something we, can actually, we could actually test. But based on what the students said in their survey and their open comments and their focus groups, and based on the professional judgments of the lecturers, they said, yes, we think the problem solving of the students improved. So that's tentatively positive. More um, certain, much more certain, was that the conceptual understanding had definitely improved of the students. And this could be seen from their judgment, from the um, uh, tutor's judgment, and from the results that they were getting. So definitely positive impact on the students' conceptual understanding. Particularly, in the law example is interesting. The, the lawyers, several modules got together, and what they did was they invented a town I think it was called Lexport, this fictional town. And they filmed lots of videos of role play scenarios of crimes and things like that that were happening in Lexport. And they populated this town. And then the criminal law people used it, and the contracts law people used it, and other modules all used this town. So the students could see connections between it. That worked really well. And the lawyers were saying, by week two, you could tell that the students' understanding, their conceptual understanding, was way in advance of what it usually was at that point. Point, early point in term. That's nice. Expectations. So we're characterizing that as the students' satisfaction. The students were largely positive, as I've described, and the module satisfaction was high. Attendance. Oh, who has a problem with attendance? You set yourself on fire in that class, and you still struggle with attendance sometimes. <laughs> it's just like, I used to have... Um, Medieval history, first year class on Friday afternoon. You can imagine how popular that was. And we would do anything to get the students in there sometimes, but uh, real struggle. So Bob had found definite positive impact on attendance. Our picture was not so rosy. This is our attendance. Had no impact at all. The modules that always got high attendance got high attendance. The modules got spiky attendance. It didn't really have much of an impact across the board. One or two people found their attendance was better. One colleague in business said, when we asked him about attendance, he said, yeah, same as last year, but the quality of the work was improved, so he was happy. But um, where people got high attendance, they were um, either tying it, perhaps tying it into an assessment, or it was a professional practice course that required attendance, or the students were more strongly motivated to attend because they were postgraduates. Same reasons, so not an impact on attendance for us. It'd be interesting to see, I mean, Bob's been doing this for 15 or 20 years, and we will get better at doing scale-up as we go, and it'd be interesting to see if we develop strategies to improve that. So no effect on attendance, and failure rates. Well, for failure rates, we didn't see much impact on failure. We don't have such high failure rates as I think that Bob had been experiencing. But we did see a positive impact with, on grades with an uplift into um, good, good two ones and firsts. And that was across the board. So that's good. That's positive. So good. Happy enough with those results to keep on doing it. I think first year pilot, that's not bad at all, is it? And we will get better at doing it. So this year we are expanding and we're going again. Okay. So let me talk about 
what next and what we've learned. I'm okay for time, aren't I? Are you all right? I, I, is, it, is it still engaging? Not if it's not, not. Do you want to do a dance, a frozen sing-along, anything like that? You know, <laughs> I haven't got a very good singing voice, but I could give it a go. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your indulgence. Right. This is the this is the payoff bit, isn't it? This is the bit you've been waiting for. So, what did we learn about doing scale up? That's an astonishingly good title for a slide, isn't it? What we learned about conditions for scale up. Sorry, that's running out of inspiration. So, some things that we learned about teaching. You, we, even though we knew it was going to be a lot of work preparing for it, it was more work than we even imagined. So you need really careful planning, particularly around group management, the group formation and management. Now, some of the colleagues said, I don't want to use Bob's method. He's got this method of the groups are um, rigorously controlled, they're selected, he moves them around, they've got roles in the groups, and some people didn't want to do that. Some colleagues said, look, I prefer the students to form their own groups, that's my style. And they had a harder time than the ones who used some sort of group management, overt group management technique. Um, resource design. Colleagues who put a couple of papers online for the students to read did not have such success with the students doing their flipped preparation as those who thought a bit more about the, des the design of the materials or maybe used videos or something perhaps more engaging. Um, and the framing of the pre-class activities, how to get the students to get into your class in a state of preparedness was it, it needs a lot of careful planning. And I think, Dave, did you use assessments in yours to get the, uh, at the beginning of the class? No, regular assessments. Regular assessments to make sure that they had. At Portsmouth, they're doing something similar, and they're, they're testing at the beginning of each class, and then finding a way to make up that um, learning somehow in the class. Preparation takes longer than you think, and you need lots of peer and specialist support building up to it when you're learning and getting comfortable with it. Buddying and um, specialist support is good. So we wrote, we've written loads of guides to this, that, and the other, and there's, lo there's lots of good literature. Bob keeps saying he's going to write a book, and I wish he would, because it would be really nice to have the scale-up playbook, you know, page one. <laughs> Get your students in the class. Other things that we learned, it worked best in courses where several modules jumped into it, I think, so that law example. No, not, not uniformly the case, but on the whole, have you ever had the experience where you're doing something innovative and your colleagues aren't, and the students perceive you to be the anomalous thing? <laughs> Why are we doing this? Yes. So if, a few of you, if you have a course plan and a few of you are doing it and everyone knows why you're doing it and you're supported, it works better. And we found that scale-up principles can be used in other classes, and that's what we're doing this year to try and see what about scale-up can we use in, a, in, in an ordinary teaching room. Next things we learned were kind of organizational and infrastructural. The spaces were loved, I think. We want bigger ones, don't we, Dave? We want bigger spaces at Clifton. Uniformly loved by students and staff, those wide spaces with the lovely round tables. The tables are loved. And Bob went on and on and on about how important the round tables are. We were like, yes, yes, Bob, that's fine. Sorry, yes, Professor Beatner, that's fine. And the round tables are really important because you've got no head of the table. All the students can see each other. It really helps engender um, collaborative group work in a way that square tables work. We've had this argument time and time again, and we've won it finally because our director of estates came along and heard Professor Beekner talking about it, and he convinced him. So now we are buying round tables. Excellent. And the circulation space is important as well. Um, we've won another minor victory within the university where there used to be pack as many in as you can into any space, and now we've managed to, to convince them that the student experience is better and the quality of learning is better if you pack fewer students into the space and allow a bit of movement space so that students and staff can move around the room. And that sounds so trivial, but it's such, you know, when people are designing these rooms and they're expecting you to get 34 students in that seminar room, <laughs> that, that makes such a difference. And anyone, anyone who's from education, is anyone from education here, School of Ed? Anyone who works with teachers will know that circulation space is, is so important. In fact, those scale of classrooms look like primary, primary classrooms, don't they? Right. Scale up is way noisy. It is so noisy. And we didn't put voice augmentation in for the 
students and the tutors at first, and we had to we have to add it. Um, the, the library, bless them, one of the spaces they gave us was a room that was right next to their silent reading area. <laughs> Oops, they so regretted that. I think they moved it now because it's really, really noisy. Um, and we have dividers between the, some of the rooms so we can reconfigure the one. That city, it's a very big room, and we need good <laughs> soundproofing between those rooms. And voice augmentation. The technology must be seamless. You know, I mentioned the Apple TV. It was up and down and up and down. It didn't work. And they bought Apple laptops for us instead of PC laptops because Apples are cool, right? But um, the students really didn't like them because they hadn't used them much before. And you really don't need technology, buggy technology when you're trying to teach, do you? So I think that's just <laughs> a given. And then finally on this, um, we, I mentioned earlier, we have a scarcity of large flat rooms that we can convert to this sort of um, space. And I mean, you've got, this is such a beautiful space. You've built this building here and you've got lots of really nice large flat and informal social learning spaces. We, we have a scarcity of those. Um, we are building this, you probably can't see it very well, this um, I stole from a state, so please don't tell them because they didn't give me permission <coughs> to use it, is a snapshot of the plans for a new teaching building at um, Clifton campus. And we've convinced them to build large, flat, scale-up spaces in there. Now, there are a significant number of people who still want um, tiered lectures, so they're, ex they're even experimenting with kind of I suppose bleacher seating that goes backwards and forwards and that you can put large uh, scale-up rooms in as well. So we're winning that argument, I'm glad to say, because you, you otherwise teaching is so constrained by the space that you find, isn't it? Absolutely constrained by what you find. And you have to cope with the space. Um, final little point is the considering the contact hours. Scale-up, really, ideally, you don't do it in an hour session. You have a three-hour session. Um, and I think the, some colleagues felt that there was going to be a like-for-like like replacement. So I was going to be replacing a lecture and a couple of seminars with a scale-up scale session. And that was going to look the same in the contact hours for the module. You know, the KISS data, you've got to report your metrics, haven't you? And, um, and it isn't. It, there's not a like-for-like like transfer. You have to redesign the contact hours and the workload model for it. I think it probably <laughs> needs a, a wee bit more front-loading on the teaching preparation. And that's something we've had to talk to, to academic team leaders, because they've got to be willing to build that consideration in um, to the workload planning. Do you do workload planning here where you fill in the big form here and make it up? You come out with 3,000 hours and you, and you go, oh, it'll be all right, it's all right, I'll work on Friday evening. So um, you have to think about that sort of thing. And yet our academic team leaders have been very supportive. We only had one instance of a colleague who was made to put lectures back in as well as scale up because they wanted to up the KISS day numbers, which is not the best, but never mind. So that's um, another thing that we learned. Have to have to prepare everybody for scale-up. It's not just impacting on the lecturer who is doing it and their students. So what we're doing next. I mentioned we're building a new um, block at Clifton. We're expanding scale-up, I'm pleased to say. The existing scale-up rooms were oversubscribed this year, so we've managed to persuade to, um, the university to convert some more. We've got some smaller spaces which aren't as good, but we're building big spaces. So these are our new scale-up spaces. And like, you know, it's not the most expensive thing in the world to convert a room. It's not, <laughs> uh, but also, actually, we've interested estates now and IS, so they are putting in collaborative spaces of different sorts um, all over the place, and they're letting us work with them and observe the teaching and work with colleagues who are going in there. So, I mean, you'll see spaces like this. I'm sure you have lots of spaces like this around your campus. But for us, we had lots and lots and lots of seminar rooms and lots and lots and lots of rooms in um, rows. And we've been doing a study um, in one of our buildings where the dominant layout is weird. It's a a boardroom U-shape, and then another band of tables here. And we've been interviewing colleagues coming out of those rooms saying, was this the ideal setup for your session? And they're going, no, actually, I would have liked some islands. And we've, we've created lots of teaching spaces that actually people don't want to teach in. So we're winning the argument now and changing the spaces slowly and making that investment. So that's great. 
And I have to say, timetabling in the States and IS have been brilliant because you can't make any of these changes without their buy-in. So I um, thought I'd finish up with a final um, quotation from one of our lecturers because I think this is really nice and sums it up. The main thing with uh, scale-up is capturing how students learn because I think years and years of evidence have shown that students do not learn the way we teach. So what we need to do is to start teaching the way they learn and that's what scale-up does. So that's a nice one on which to end. So that's all I'm going to say. I hope I've uh, not gone over time. Thank you very much for in your indulgence. And um, that's it. Thank you.